have a number. He didn't have our number. I put it in the email that I sent him this morning. Hi. Hi. You, you didn't get my email then. I, I didn't. It's good to see you, Mom. It's good to see you, too. So I hear you had some time with your grandkids. Yeah, I did. Dad. Um, with, yeah, with our great grandkids. Bless you, son. Yeah, no, it was a lot of fun. A great, great deal of fun. I was goofing around with them and chasing them as they um, played with their car. Wonderful. And so forth. And Melissa loaned us her house, which was quite nice. Well, that's great. Yeah, so they, they took off for a little bit, for a couple hours. and Well, we saw Daniel in his play last night. You yeah. mean Ryan? Ryan, excuse me. R Ryan, okay. Ryan. What, uh, what was the play? He, what was he his played part? Creon, the king. In, oh. uh, Sophocles, uh, Antigone. Antigone, oh wow. And he, he did well. Wow, okay. Yeah. So, um, what, uh, what are we here to do? Well, to, to talk a little bit about um, science and religion, I guess, and, and your thoughts about science and religion and my thoughts. and. Have a little discussion of that. And, okay. Um, that so where do we start? With science or re with religion? Um, well, or may maybe we can start with, well, part, part of it is because of the work that I do, right, is, is on the intersection of the two mm -hmm. and um, involves evolution and so forth. And so that, that's perhaps something that, that you have thoughts about in, in terms of evolution. And, oh, I have lots of thoughts Yeah, about so we, we, could, we could start with that and have a little discussion. Okay, so your interface is between science and uh, philosophy mm -hmm. and and religion, right? Okay. <laughs> okay, so we, maybe we can talk a little, little bit first about your thoughts about evolution. We can have a discussion about evolution and and Christianity versus the, the views I'm working on and so forth. Well, I, I come at it from a perspective of science, therapy, uh, and uh, religion. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the Lord has given me some models over the years that I've used with my clients that have been uh, profoundly helpful to them. And uh, so uh, what you've done and the work that you've done has been very important to me personally, okay. and uh, I've it, it's uh, helped me to think about things very differently, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate the the uh, originality of what you've done, and I recognize that the work that you've done has been. Um, it's been done with, um, it had to be done persistently. <laughs> You've always had a, uh, I mean, you were born with a long attention span. <laughs> uh, we, uh, your mother and I have remarked about that a lot. But this is one of the things I think that the Lord has used to uh, give you all your insights and uh, that's you're blessed, mm -hmm. and I and I we marvel at that and we appreciate it. Okay, as far as the uh, <coughs> the the uh, business about evolution is concerned, what you've done, in my opinion, mm -hmm. is that you've provided uh, an ontology that uh, makes it possible for. Uh, uh, born again Christianity uh, to operate in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, uh, the models that you, that you have come up with and that you've used are powerful in, uh, to me in that uh, it goes counter to the ontology that is, has basically had a monopoly mm -hmm. uh, uh, in our world, and that's physicalism. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but you've, you've, you're now providing an alternative to that. Right. Which I certainly appreciate. And uh, as far as therapy is concerned, I see this opening up the way 
for integration, uh, helping uh, people to integrate, which is a very healthy thing mm -hmm. psychologically. And uh, so I've been kind of working on that aspect of your work. Right. right. Okay. And enjoying it very much. Uh, I'm, I'm in the process of trying to put it all together and right. make sense out of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, right now. But uh, uh, so I come at it from the science perspective, the, uh, uh, the uh, born again Christian perspective, the therapeutic pers perspective, and what where I've been uh, working is in models that in integrate. Mm -hmm. Okay. You ask the question, that's the answer for me. Right, yeah, and I can understand that um, the ontology that comes out of my work is very, very, um, you know, amenable to a Christian ontology in the sense that you don't like physicalism, and I'm showing effectively that physicalism is false. So that, that really does work pretty well there. But I use evolution, and, and you know, and I know we've had discussions about evolution that where, where you're not in, in favor of evolution. So in, any thoughts about that? I'm, I'm using yeah, the, the uh, theory of evolution itself pretty strongly to, to come to these yeah. anti-physicalists. I've, I've pondered, uh, when you took that tack, right. I, I pondered uh, what was going on there. Mm -hmm. But what you did was to uh, show that um, truth and fitness uh, are, are, are not necessarily the same thing, right. and that truth will go to extinction mm -hmm. when, uh, uh, when fitness, fitness will be there, and fitness will win. Right. Okay. And, uh, but this is, the, the, this is the, the problem. The context in which you're operating is not big enough, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay? Because uh, the, uh, the context needs to be expanded because there is a spiritual side to life, mm -hmm. okay? And that spiritual side is eternal. The, the, the context, uh, the, uh, the physical context is mm -hmm. going to pass away for all of us, mm -hmm. okay? But there's a spiritual context and uh, I'm uh, the Lord's been helping me develop a model that, that mm -hmm. puts that all together. And evolution then becomes uh, a subset or a w one way of looking at mm -hmm. what things are. Okay. Right. And uh, you turn beyond to that when you uh, shared with me uh, about uh, the concept of the uh, evolution of, of uh, uh, basically life, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And uh, so uh, to me, evolution is a result of limitation of perspective, mm -hmm. okay. So the pers mm -hmm. perspective needs to be bigger, mm -hmm. okay. And uh, I think that I've got some thoughts about that, and I'm working on that. All right. So I don't see that there's a a problem mm -hmm. with evolution. I just think that it's uh, um, a, a limitation of a bigger uh, concept. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, that's that's good to hear. Yeah. So you ask. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's it's, and I agree with that. Eventually, this theory of you know, conscious agents could have therapeutic implications. Um, I mean, if we actually understand the principles by which consciousness evolves and, and so forth, then, then it could actually lead to a better understanding of our unconscious dynamics mm -hmm. and, and um, new, new therapeutic techniques. Certainly could. And, and it certainly is an ontology that's compatible, m more compatible with many religious points of view, much more than physicalism, right? Mm -hmm. So rejecting physicalism does give um, many religious groups the, what they really prize the most, which is a different ontology, mm -hmm. a, a non-physicalist ontology. Well, like I said, the, the, the different ontology is crucial, mm -hmm. right. in, in my opinion. But leaving the, uh, the, the, or leaving the place uh, 
at the evolutionary perspective mm -hmm. um, is only uh, a very limited view of a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in the bigger picture, uh, when, when we're operating apart from God, then the further we are apart from God, the less truth we have access to. So basically, I, I see evolution as being what you, you can come to when your assumption is that God is not. Okay. Okay? So, so you're saying that if we take an atheistic position, then we'll come to evolution? Is yep. That... Right. I mean, that's one, one uh, approach you can take. Okay. But perhaps not the only. For example, C.S. Lewis also believed in evolution. Yeah, well, uh, Scripture does not. Aha. Uh -huh. You think it doesn't? No. No. Uh, it, it, creation, not evolution. And it's, it's very clear. Studying the Scripture as a born-again Christian, uh -huh. you know, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. That's scriptural. Mm -hmm. And that's been my experience, okay? Mm -hmm. As I've had a chance to walk with the Lord, what he's done is to uh, put things, put knowledge in a spiritual context. Mm -hmm. When you put knowledge in a spiritual context, I mean, I'm, when I say spiritual, I'm talking about born-again Christian, mm -hmm. biblical context, then you get a different understanding than putting it in a human context. Right. And evolution is knowledge that's been put in a human context, not a godly context. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's true when you're in this context. I mean, you can, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can come to that conclusion when you're in a, a carnal context, but you can't come to that conclusion in a biblical context. And I agree that um, in ultimately, one, one could argue that I've used evolution to show that evolution is false, and therefore I've shot myself in the foot, right? I've got myself into a logical bind. I start with evolution, I end up destroying physicalism, mm -hmm. but evolution in, in biology in, involves belief in physicalism. There are I, genes. I've had a lot of fun with that. Right, right. So, but, but of course, if I'm actually caught in that kind of logical paradox, then I've actually destroyed myself in the process. But I know you're not. Right, right. I'm, I'm actually using just the, the abstract algorithm of evolution, yeah. the, the, what, what Dennett and right. Dawkins call universal Darwinism, yeah. to, uh, and that's what's captured in evolutionary game theory, and I use that to destroy the physicalism of, of evolution. But I guess, so yeah, right. I, I agree that, you know, many religions, including Christianity, would love the ontology that's coming out of this. But I guess the place where there's a, a difference between the scientific attitude and, and, and the religious attitude on it is actually in the attitude toward um, infallible scriptures, right? And the attitude of science is always the attitude of, I could be wrong. Everything I say, I could be wrong. Whereas the, the attitude that, that often I see in religions is, you know, our book is absolutely right letter for letter perfect and couldn't be wrong. So that so I think that what I'm offering is half what Christianity would like and half what it wouldn't like, right? Because the the other half, I mean, one half is physicalism is dead, which is I think what Christianity really likes. The other half is there are no books that can't be questioned and no words in books that that shouldn't be, be questioned. So that, you know, and, and when someone says that they have you know, a word from God, to, to, that we're in a position to even question that. So suppose, suppose I came out and said, I've got a word from God, and it's, it's absolutely um, unconscionable for women to talk in church. They shouldn't even be able to ask questions. I said, that's my word from God. If it's not in agreement with the word, it's not a word from God. That, that's right. So, so if I said that, you would feel like, well, I, you know, I'm claiming that it's a word from God, but um, you know, it's probably just me. I would toss it out. You would toss it out. Well, you know, we're admonished to 
uh, examine uh, anything that comes as a word from God. Right. And the th there are three tests mm -hmm. uh, given in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, uh, verse uh, 3 that say, first of all, a word from God is going to be edifying. It's going to build you up mm -hmm. and not tear you down. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it's going to encourage you in the faith and not discourage you from the faith. Right. Number three, it's going to be comforting, which means it's going to be appropriate for the need that faces you right now. Okay. okay? So those are tests that were required as, as uh, born-again Christians, baptized in the Holy Spirit, to use to determine. Now, there are, there's three other tests, and one of them has been mentioned, that it is uh, that if it's from God, it's going to agree with Scripture. Mm -hmm. But also, it's, it's going to have a witness of the Holy Spirit inside. Mm -hmm. You're going to know inside that the Holy Spirit is saying, yeah, so there's the witness of the Spirit, agreement with the Word, and then how God works the, His providential dealing out in our life, the situations that we come to have to deal with. When all three of those line up, then you have a high degree of confidence mm -hmm. that you're being guided by God. Okay. Now, most Christians, uh, particularly the ones that we deal with, don't have a clue about that kind of stuff, okay? But the but the one that I propose, you know, so I come here and I say that, you know, it's it's really inappropriate for women to ever talk to even ask questions in church. That would sort of fail all those all those tests. Yeah. So it's not a word from God. But it's First Corinthians fourteen thirty four, word for word. But the very same chapter you quoted for the principles for what is a word from God. In verse 34, the very same chapter says exactly this. Paul said, women may not speak at all in the church, and they're not allowed to ask questions. It's not appropriate. And he said, if anybody wants to question me, this is the word of God. Now, my own attitude about it is that it does fail the very principles that you mm -hmm. proposed, mm -hmm. and that therefore that particular passage is even though it's word for word there, Paul says, for 1 Corinthians 14, 34, women cannot talk in church. To their credit, no church obeys that. Every church says effectively, forget that. That's not the word of God. It's the word of a man who needs psychotherapy. He had some issues about women. He needed help. And so that's, that's the kind of attitude I'm proposing about looking at the Bible itself, right? That we have to take the parts take it verse by verse when it says love your neighbor as yourself fabulous I'm all for that but when Paul says women cannot speak in church to their credit no church listens to him every church says forget that and so I think churches are in fact doing what I'm suggesting which is to take each verse weigh it according to the kinds of criterion you were talking about and sometimes rejecting what Paul says because it sounded like he had issues or he was mistaking a cultural norm for the Word of God which is another, you know, cultural norms aren't, aren't the word of God, too. So I don't, I don't know what you would think about that, that kind of argument. Well, I, uh, what I would share about that is that uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, if you look at them, they don't agree. They're, I mean, in the Old Testament, you have, if you didn't right. obey the law, you know, after Abraham, if you mm -hmm. didn't obey the law, or Moses, you didn't obey the law, then uh, you were dealt with harshly. Right. Okay. But everything changed at the cross, mm -hmm. and uh, Jesus took care of all of our sin. Mm -hmm. That's all taken care of, past, present, and future uh -huh. sin. That's scriptural. And so, uh, you know, you have to take. Uh, scripture and and have and deal with the Holy Spirit taking into consideration culture uh, right. and, and the understanding that God was working in right then I mean uh, for us the Bible says certain things but we have to take that knowledge and put it put it in the context of 
uh, to get understanding. And so, uh, you know, we've all mm -hmm. sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we all have a problem with that. Right. So that, ver that verse from Paul. So my attitude would be that um, I learned a lot of good things from St. Paul, and, but he's a human being, and he had cultural influences, and he also made mistakes, and he wrote them down. And I think you know, religious people can just be intelligent about and take a book like the Bible and look for the things in it that will really help them, and then see other stuff like Paul saying women should be silent and say, you know what, um, at best that was a cultural norm. Um, it's certainly not the word of God, and it's certainly not something we should be doing today. But, but if we go there, then, then what that really does is open up the entire Bible for that kind of, I think, very intelligent discourse where you, you look and say, this makes sense, and, and this doesn't, according to the kinds of criterion that you talked about. Okay. Uh, the, the problem is trying to understand without the benefit of the teaching of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Without the Holy Spirit, we're pretty well screwed as far as that's concerned, okay? We have to, we have to have the Holy Spirit. We have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit in order to have the power and get the understanding from God. Uh, and, and the understanding, you can have two understandings at the same time, one human understanding, one godly understanding, okay? Well, what, you mean, I do actually hope at some point to have some kind of rapprochement between science and religion. Mm -hmm. And I think that both sides have something to gain in the process and something very, very difficult to lose. For, for science, it's giving up the physicalism. <coughs> and that's the part that I think the religious side really like, is letting go of the physicalism. Uh, but then what science has is the advantage of, of the methodology of science, which is never accept anything always question everything, even, even if it, Einstein said it, it's not the truth, right? It's, it's, it's an interesting idea to take very, very seriously to examine. So there's a freedom from, yeah, at least in the ideal sense, a freedom from dogmatism. Of course, any individual scientist is dogmatic about their own theories, but the science as a whole is not because the other scientists are very happy to tell you that you're wrong. So as a, as a, a discipline, science has this non-dogmatic uh, aspect. So that's what I think is really powerful about bringing the two together, bringing the, the non-dogmatic, but you know, more let's put these things out as, as ideas that we can discuss and refine so that it's a dynamic process. And that, so that's, that's different from what, what most religious traditions have, right? It's, it's mostly this is a scripture, every word of it can't be questioned. And, and so, so I feel like from my point of view, the way I want to move forward is I, I'm to the point where I'm letting go of the physicalism, which religion's like, but I'm also letting go of the dogmatism and saying, you know, every, like every verse in the Bible is something that I can look at and say this makes sense or, or this doesn't. We should discuss it um, and, and, and move forward or not, depending on what we, what we see in it. And if we have that kind of rapprochement, then I actually think we would have a evolving spirituality where we actually um, can move very, very much more quickly forward in terms of understanding who we are um, as you know, beings that are not just space-time bound beings, something you know, conscious. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And <clears throat> the, uh, the problem is that the universe, the universe as we know it is mathematical, okay? Mm -hmm. But, <clears throat> That's not all the universe is. <laughs> right. That's not all there is. There's the mathematical aspect. There's the linguistic aspect. And then there's the purpose of the whole thing. Right. Okay. And uh, that's one of the uh, reasons why I like your model mm -hmm. uh, of conscious agents is because the pathway between experience and uh, uh, dis uh, decision. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then the pathway between decision and and the world and the, the world and experience, mm -hmm. those uh, uh, are three different aspects, and require three different uh, 
Markovian kernels, right. as you put it. Right. Okay. From my perspective, three different models uh, because there are different functions involved. Right. And you cannot, you, you can get a third of it with mathematics. Right. But only a third. The other third is linguistics, and then the the third that counts most of all is purpose. Mm -hmm. And the only way you can get purpose is to check with God, because He's the one that's created us all. He and we've been created with purpose, mm -hmm. for a purpose. Mm -hmm. And perception without purpose is meaningless. Perception with purpose is meaningful. Okay. And, and what is the purpose? Would, what would you say is the purpose then? Well, uh, the, our, our purpose is to uh, know God and enjoy Him forever. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, joy is a very positive thing. Right. <laughs> so enjoyment. Yeah, that's one place where my model hasn't gone, which is the purpose side of things. I, mm -hmm. I, I'm still not there. I, I'm thinking, I've been thinking about that, right? From an evolutionary point of view, which is, you know, the standard, now I'm talking evolutionary psychology kind of point of view. Um, and also just evolutionary biology more generally, purpose comes down to um, taking actions that will allow you to survive long enough to reproduce. Um, but, and, and so then from that point of view, all of our emotions and so forth have been shaped by evolution to guide us in ways that, you know, to behave in ways that are adaptive so that we will survive long enough to reproduce. And, and that's the notion of purpose within evolution, evo evolution, evolutionary psychology. But I myself don't feel comfortable that that's enough, right? Because I, I feel like the evolution, I mean, I use evolutionary psychology, I think it's a really powerful framework, and I actually think it'll be very useful going forward for, for therapy, that, that even with its inadequacies, using evolutionary psychology to understand the roots of our emotions, why we have um, anger, why we are so angry at cheaters, um, um, relationships between men and women, and the, the different um, things that are going on there, why men and women are so different, a lot of that is understood by evolutionary psychology and can help in, in therapy. And so I think short term there will be the, an evolutionary psychotherapy coming out of evolutionary psychology that will be really, really insightful. But, but I still feel even beyond that that we'll still need a deeper theory. Um, so I, I see that happening over several decades and, and being a real win for, for psychotherapy. But then. I want an even deeper understanding, um, based because we don't yet. I, I don't yet have a theory of evolution that's based on conscious agents, right? So right now I'm just using theory of evolution as it's in the physicalist theory, you know, mm -hmm. biological evolution, and I'm using that to show that the physicalist assumptions are false. Mm -hmm. But what I have to do now, and I haven't done it, it's, it's a hard mathematical problem. It's an enormous it's problem. A, but but at least it's it's a it's a it's a specific goal I've got, which is to mm -hmm. develop a mathematical model of the evolution of consciousness, to understand what are the why does consciousness evolve, what's it about, um, which then involves this notion of purpose. You know, so what is the reason for an evolution, why should consciousness change at all? But then to understand an evolution of consciousness, and then take that evolution, if I project it back, whatever theory of evolution of consciousness I get, if I project it back into the space-time interface of Homo sapiens, then I should get Darwin, right? Then I should get back standard Darwinian evolution if I do that. So that would be a, a constraint that I would require on any theory of, of evolution of consciousness that I came up with, would be that that theory, when I project it back into space-time, as we perceive it, um, and matter, would give us back standard Darwinian evolution, which within that framework is, is quite well, I think, quite well con confirmed. But I don't yet have the theory of evolution of consciousness itself. So I'm so I, whereas in many other cases I can say you know I've, I've got the theorems, I've got the mathematics, I can I can close the books on physicalism. 
I can't close the books yet on a theory of purpose because I just haven't done that. So, so there, there, I'm. I don't have anything to offer back except to say that I don't have it, and I'm very interested in pursuing it. But I really am interested in pursuing it using a mathematical model as much as possible. My feeling is that that eventually, even spirituality can be, in some sense, an empirical enterprise where we actually have theories about consciousness. Oh, I agree. And we could actually then go beyond, and, and that's where I think the, you know, having a different attitude toward the scriptures of, of all the religions, not, not just Christianity, but an attitude of get inspiration where it makes sense, and then take passages where they say women shouldn't talk, and, and treat them as they should be treated, is not the word of God for today. That's definitely not what we should be doing. And to have that attitude towards the scriptures, then I think we can actually have a, an evolutionary spirituality that where science and religion could actually um, meet and, and produce something that's really quite powerful, that's well, very human and yet very rigorous. I will. I'll send you a copy of my model of your when model, I okay. get far enough along. Well, now I know where I got the genes for making models. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I agree with you, and I mm -hmm. recognize that. See, the, the, the problem about working on purpose is pur purpose is personal. Mm -hmm. It's not mathematical. Right, right. Okay. So, uh, purpose is outside the scope of mathematics. I mean, you could have a purpose for mathematics, mm -hmm. but purpose itself is outside the scope. It, it's too big an issue to be captured by mathematics. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> linguistics is l limited in that regard also. Okay. Only God has purpose that counts because he created us. And uh, so, therefore, he's the one that uh, can uh, make everything work, <laughs> you know, and he has a purpose for our life. Whether we, uh, whether we seek that purpose or not mm -hmm. is up to us. He won't transgress our will, mm -hmm. okay? But the purpose is there, mm -hmm. and there's blessings that go with seeking that purpose. I would agree that um, purpose is not itself mathematics, but I think but I would say also that you know, my experience of the taste of chocolate is not mathematics. And yet I'm using mathematics to model conscious experiences and being, I think, successful at it. And I think eventually, even though I agree that purpose itself is not mathematics, if we understand, if we get a deeper understanding of what purpose is, then I can find mathematical correlates to, to model that. Just like, for example, the space around us that, you know, is not mathematics. But we can use Euclidean spaces, you know, R3, to, to model it, even though the mathematics isn't the space. We can use Euclidean space, and then we find out that that's not quite right. It, space really isn't Euclidean, it's more Minkowski. And then we find out that's not right, you know, we go from special relativity to general relativity, we find out it's Riemannian and so forth. And so what we do is we use the mathematics as a model of something that's not mathematics, we know it's, space is just space. And as scientists, then we use that to try to get the deepest understanding we can with the help of the mathematics as a cognitive lever to help us go places, you know, conceptually that we might not be able to go without the mathematics. And that's what I'd hope with, with purpose, to, to have some deep intuitions. And I'd be happy to get some from scriptures or wherever I can get them, to get deep intuitions about purpose, what it's about, and then try to capture them in mathematics where I don't mistake the mathematics for the purpose. This mathematics is just a model. In, in the same sense as if I have a simulation of the weather, right? And I have a mathematical model of the weather, and I, come, I bring you into the computer room to show you my model, you don't need an umbrella. The simulation's not gonna get you wet. Uh, it's, it's just a simulation, but it's nevertheless a very useful simulation of the weather, and it can actually be used you know, effectively to predict the future weather. And so I, I don't mistake the mathematics itself for the purpose, but I would love to get and this is, again, the attitude I have about all things that, that are taken as, as spiritual, where we take these concepts that for thousands of years have been only intuitive, and we take those intuitions, which I think are a good starting point. In fact, all science starts with intuitions, and then wrap as much mathematics as we can into it 
knowing full well that we're probably wrong the first time, right? Space is not Euclidean. It's not Minkowski. It's probably not Riemannian. But every time we find out why we're wrong with our mathematics, we learn. And we, in our own intuitions, get multiplied. And so I'm hoping the same thing will happen ultimately in, in a more um, open, almost scientific kind of spirituality where, where we're taking the concepts that have been viewed as completely, you know, off the, off the table for mathematics, put them onto the table, start to develop strong mathematical models, and try to make predictions even in terms of therapeutic contexts. So if this is my mathematical model of purpose, and this is a very human thing, what does it tell me about interactions with people and, and psychotherapeutic techniques? And so ultimately, this, this uh, uh, really scientific theory of this stuff, where we don't mistake the mathematics for the purpose and the other aspects, but we use it to, as a cognitive lever, we can actually bring science and religion together to really move things forward in a way where we can actually help people, um, be my, my hope. There's a person who's already done that. Okay. Yeah, that's Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. Okay. He, he, he is the model. He is the model uh, for all of us for everything. He is the truth. Okay, so if we want to pursue truth, then truth is a person. It's not a thing. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so uh, he came as a model, but he came for a purpose, and that was to provide a way for us who are natural sinners, uh, we missed the mark, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, have a way to uh, uh, be resolved or uh, have our relationship with God, the Father, restored richly. And so that's why it's important to be a born-again Christian. There's only one way to get to God the Father, mm -hmm. and that's through Jesus. There is no other way, period. That's it. Now, I agree with you in terms, take the math as far as you can go. Uh, but the, but God goes further than that. You know, why not go for the whole gusto? Right, right. Well, yeah, and I certainly agree that there are um, probably endogenous limits to what, where our concepts can take us. Right, We're a species like any other species. And we yeah, don't we're finite. We don't expect we monkeys. We've got boundaries. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Spiders can't learn physics, and maybe we can't understand the nature of reality on our right. own. But What's when we're born again as a Christian, those limitations don't last after we leave this uh, body. Those, those limitations are lifted. What, what I'm hoping for is, though, that when we bring the mathematics to these issues, that, that we can get to the place where we're make, making mathematically precise predictions about how we can grow as people, evolve as people, have better relationships and so forth, and actually have a, a mathematically precise understanding of who we are as, as conscious beings and maybe hierarchies of conscious agents that will allow us to, to take our therapeutic and, and social understanding to the to the next level but do so in a, a really rigorous fashion where we actually have ideas that we put out that we say I could be wrong about this so it's a very non dogmatic attitude about the whole thing it's it's saying you know even spirituality is an experimental science and we have our current ideas and our current ideas are the best we've got right now but there's a, there's a deep humility in the whole thing where we say you know what even the best that I understand right now, I could be wrong on any point, and and then to then say, so let's let's see where 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 might I be wrong on on anything that I'm saying. Oh, in uh, in presenting Jesus today, there are three uh, three aspects mm -hmm. that have to be fulfilled. First of all, to present Jesus today. Uh, there has to be love, there has to be purity, and there has to be power, okay? Now, the love, you can, you can find a description of that, the nine aspects of love, in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It's through the Spirit. <clears throat> the attitudes 
that lead to purity mm -hmm. are described by nine Beatitudes in Matthew 5, uh, <clears throat> uh, verses 3 to 12. Mm -hmm. The gifts of the Holy Spirit, the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, are described in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 11. Okay. Mm. Now, if you if you take these and put them in the right sequence, and, and you make uh, and make vectors out of them, mm -hmm. and uh, in my case, I've I've done it. You take a you take a um, a uh, fruit, you take an attitude, you take a gift, you put them together in the right sequence in the right way, and mm -hmm. you can represent uh, Christ appropriately. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, when, when Jesus was walking on the earth, he made it very clear to the Pharisees that they were whited sepulchers, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, that they stood in the way of people getting their salvation. They stood in the door and prevented people from getting through. And he said he, they were a generation of vipers, okay? Mm -hmm. And the reason he said that is because he said, you know the law. You know the law. Right. But you don't understand that all that points to me. Right. Okay? So you can be legalistic, mm -hmm. and mathematics is very legalistic. Right. It's unbending. It's unyielding. That's why... You, 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 you like it, okay? But that all of that perfection points to one man, Jesus, who is God. Well, the, the mathematics can be flexible, right? It, it's, it, it can be flexible and, and malleable. But the, I guess the attitude that I have of, of, of sort of an empirical kind of spirituality where we're all working together to try to grow and understand and so forth uh, and and they pull out stones to, to kill him and he says why are you going to kill me and, and they say to him because you being a mere man claim to be the son of God and then Jesus says um, but haven't you read the scriptures that say I have said all of you are gods and all of you are sons of the most high and then Jesus goes on to say and if he says that they're gods to whom the word of God came, and Jesus very, very careful, says, and the scripture cannot be broken, then why are you trying to kill me just for claiming I'm the son of God? So what Jesus is making very, very clear there is that we're all gods, we're all sons of God, but we're all gods, and from that point of view, we're all in a position to discuss with each other and grow on, on an equal footing. In, in other words, I, so I'm, what I'm suggesting is if you, if you take the, want to take the scriptures literally, that scripture is literally saying each one of us is God's, and, and Jesus sort of emphasizes that point. He says, I have said you are God's, and the scripture cannot be set, set aside on this point. He said, don't, don't let the scripture be set aside on this point. So we have to take that, that point very, very seriously. And one place where, where you go, if you take that very seriously, is it says, we're all of us then qualified as gods to explore what this whole thing is about and to go back and forth about it. Now, in, in saying that we're gods, that's God with a little g. Uh, he's given us uh, dominion over the earth, not the heavens. He's given us dominion over the earth, okay? That's what he said in Genesis. That's what he told Adam and Eve. But that wasn't Jesus' argument, right? Jesus was saying to the Pharisees, I said that you were gods. Yeah. I'm only claiming to be the son of God, so you shouldn't be killing me for being just the son of God. That's right. They were claiming something bigger. So Jesus' point was not God with a little g. I mean, his whole argument was the opposite. You guys are gods with a big g. I'm just claiming to be the son of God. And so that was, that was his argument to them. When we're born again, and we're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Our spirit becomes one mm -hmm. with the Holy Spirit. Okay? So from that perspective, we are. Mm -hmm. We've got everything that Jesus has. Our problem is most of us don't know what we have. 
from Scripture. We don't know the authority that we have, and we don't know how to use it. Okay? And I agree with you that, that there's a lot of uh, growth that needs to take place in, in uh, the majority of Christians, in all Christians, <laughs> including me, right. all right, and scientists, right. and uh, anybody else. Now, Jesus, in terms of theology, Jesus was perfect theology. He's the model. Okay? So, uh, so where we where we're going to get our point of integration is around him personally, and if we inter integrate ourselves psychologically around him and spiritually and physically around him, then we're going to have as perfect uh, an operating uh, life as we could have, mm -hmm. okay, and powerful, okay. Did you want to throw in anything, Mom, in all this conversation? No, I'm do I'm happy listening. Oh, okay. But <laughs> <Okay. laughs> well, we've had fun. Haven't yeah, we? yeah, no, absolutely. It's 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 a good discussion. Well, now we've broken the ice on that. Why well, we can talk some more? All right, right. Other other issues that you guys think we might want to bring up, or that you think as yeah, a scientist right. I want to get. More, you know, yeah. I'm happy to look at the model and, and get as much intuition as I can there. Yeah. My, my, my feeling about this is that if we take this more open attitude, non-dogmatic, where we just, it's a free-for-all, everybody has the freedom to put their ideas out there and we explore them, that we could really push things forward very, very quickly. I agree, attitude. and I believe that what you've done right. in terms of getting the ontology right. turned around going in the same direction as spirituality, okay? Now you can, now harmony can take place. Yeah, I think, I think it really can. The, the only thing is, is I, mean, I, I agree, the ontology you know, is remarkably amenable to most religious points of view. It's remarkable that it comes out that way. Um, and it's you know, against physical, and so many of my scientific colleagues are, are stunned, but then they finally understand it and they go, yeah, you got me. But, Physicalism doesn't seem to be right. So the next step is just letting go of dogmatism. My, my feeling is that claims of infallibility have always gone bad in human history, right? It's, it, it leads to wars between religions, it leads to strife and so forth. An attitude of humility that says, you know what, here's my current point of view, but I could be wrong. Let's have a discussion and let's find out where I've got things wrong. And we're, and we're having that kind of dialogue from mm -hmm. a point of humility, that's where we can really make progress very, very quickly. And, and so m when I put out a ma mathematical model, I'm very careful when I do that in, like in a public setting to say, I'm putting this out to be precise so we can find out precisely why I'm wrong. And that's the attitude I would love to see happening in spirituality, where it's instead of saying, you know, it's my way or the highway, it's rather, here, here is, a, I think, a beautiful idea, but let's explore it and see where I might be wrong. And with that attitude, I, would, I think we have the best chance of really moving forward and having a spirit that doesn't lead to, um, you know, the fighting. I agree right. with you. Yeah. And uh, that's one of the reasons that I really enjoy Andrew Womack and uh, Bill Johnson. Okay. Andrew Womack up in Colorado and Bill Johnson up in Redding, California, because they have that kind of open spirit. Okay. 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 And uh, <clears throat> you know what I've what I've observed is that there are there that a Christian. So one of the conclusions of your father was that when you're looking for a model, there is a model. It's Jesus. Right. Right. Well, and and. I think that I can look to Jesus' life for insight and, and guidance, but as a scientist, I'm eventually going to look at it with a critical eye, and um, maybe there are parts of it that I don't think are, are a great model, and to, to pick and choose for myself what I think is, is worth, and, and what's inspiring and what, what is not. Um, so, so but I'll find my inspiration there and, and other places as well. So our attitudes are a little bit different on that point. And about the fact that he said, everything you do, 
you're guided by God yourself. Well, I'll have to think about what, what he's saying there. Part of the problem is that I don't have my own mathematical understanding of what God might be, if, if I can at all. So for, for me as a scientist, until I can unpack what in the theory of conscious agents might correspond to that, it's, it's hard for me to, to grapple with the, with, with the problem. I mean, one thing that seems to come out of my theory is that no consciousness is omniscient. And that would seem to be against what most ideas about God say. So if, if that's the case, and again, that's just my current understanding of my model, even there I could be wrong. But right now my understanding of my model is that, that no conscious agent could be omniscient, even in the sense of completely self-understanding. But so, can you allow yourself the idea that you're guided by God? Well, if, I, I'm a, I certainly would allow myself to try to unpack that statement in a rigorous mathematical way at some point and to, to, to unpack that. Um, but suppose what, your father is right. Well, if, if he's right, then I'll get some kind of mathematical understanding of what, what a rigorous understanding of God means, and um, if that's possible, and then um, an interpretation of what he's saying that would, would make sense to me. What I don't want is a hand wave instead of understanding. That's, that's what, 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 I mean, these can sometimes be statements that you just hear and, and repeat that have been heard and repeated for many, many centuries. And I would like to go beyond just repeating what people have said for thousands of years. I would like to actually get testable hypotheses that make predictions that, I, that are surprising to me um, and to start to make progress. Um, because the, the kind of thing where you say Jesus is the model is something you could have said you know, 1,800 years ago in the same way. I would like to start to say something new in, in a rigorously mathematical way. So, I mean, ultimately, who knows where it will lead me? I, I don't. It maybe could lead me to reject everything he's saying. Or maybe it will lead me to to say this, you know, I understand you in this particular fashion, but that may be, not be the fashion in which you understood it. So so we'll see where, where the mathematics leads. It's an open enterprise. Are you happy? Yeah. Yeah. I'm happy with the, the, the tenor of the conversation. I, I was glad that, that he was, they were not um, defensive. I expected them to be more defensive about it, especially when I was talking about um, not taking every word of the Bible as, you know, infallible word of God. I mean, for me, that's absolutely essential to, to secure that point, because if you take it as the infallible word of God, there's no chance for progress. I mean, if it's all set in stone, how can we how can we grow? So I was delighted that they seemed to let go of that point. Although I had to hit them with a pretty hard example to, to make that happen. <laughs> yeah. uh, that is your problem. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Any other question or? No. Okay. I'm out of questions. Okay.